All right, we need intros. We're going to be recording these soon, so get your last intros in. Gods at digigods.com. Gods at digigods.com. Send us your cool intros and uh, Vox boxes. We're missing Vox boxes. Emails, whatever else you got. Naughty photos, insults, nasty tweets. My goodness, people have gotten so nasty on Twitter. That was the thing during the, uh, the, 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 the big football game, Mark. You uh-huh. watched the big football game, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the... the, uh, the, the it was the, the only football game I watched all year. It was uh, Real Madrid against that other really small team in, the, in La Liga, like Granada, whatever it was. Uh-huh. Anyway, I couldn't believe it. It was like the... Yeah. <laughs> it, it was. That was. That was going on at the exact same time. It was time. boring. You know, it, it was a boring game. The, none of the commercials were all that distinctive. I mean, no. some were funny the, with the with the with the monkey puppy thing. No, that was not that was not funny. That was the creepiest. That was wrong. That was the idea. I, it was horrendous, and it's promoting some weird new what like Mountain Dew triple flavor. What? What is that? Like a like a like some kind of soft drink layer cake? It's got water and juice and cocaine. What? I know. What? Oh, it was a, it was a, it was like a sprite or something. Yeah, no, it's like it's like. I gotta ma- buy a car. That's it's like Mountain Dew. It's like Mountain Dew infused with uh, with, with uh, Red Bull. Yeah, basically, and and, 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 and juice. It's like got caffeine and juice in it. What? The, what? Wait, I have to buy a car. I know. Ugh, it's I'm the sorry. Worst. It sucks. Shopping for cars is the worst. Well, you know what it is. I I I already I haven't narrowed down to like the only five cars that I can afford in my yeah. price point. You know what? Let me get, uh, take some advice. Should, from should me. I get an Audi? Here's uh, the thing. Here, here, no, take my advice. Of the cars you can afford. Don't go for the Maserati. They don't have great mechanics. They look nice, but the paint the paint is always terrible on the Maseratis. Maserati. Um uh you can't go wrong with the rolls. But oh, the I rolls. know but I know I know you're thinking I can afford them. Wait, 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 wait. I know you, you're thinking you Fer- funny. Ferrari can... or Lamborghini. No, 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 no. You're being f- Maseratis are not they're, they're they're not the Maseratis that we grew up with. That's they're not true. two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> That's anybody true. can afford a Maserati. They're, That's kind of true. Yeah. And but they do have terrible car. paint jobs. Whatever. So uh I have to get a new car. It really sucks. Okay, I test drove a BMW 5 Series today. What about a Tesla? You think you, you? I would love. I those cars are beautiful. They're, you realize they're inspirational. That they're beautiful. The thing is that yeah, they're like expensive. a forty forty thousand dollars sedan coming out. Yeah, in three years. No, like now. No, m- like my car doesn't work now. Oh, okay. I can't wait for the okay. forty thousand dollars. First of all, let's say let's say it did come out tomorrow. Yeah. You realize there's already a waiting list of like three years. Yeah. Okay. I test drove a BMW 5 Series. Okay. I liked it. You're right. It's a little stiff. They're stiff. I'm not a big fan of BMW. I, know. Uh, I can get another Lexus, mm-hmm. but I feel like I've sort of been there. Here's yeah. the thing. And I'm being honest with our listeners. You I know. have about like three more – I have about three more jobs left in me before I die. Yeah. So I figured this is like one of my last chances <laughs> to buy an actual true car. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like I, I don't have much that's time. Such a, that's so Alvy Singer. How many more cars am I going to own so in my Alvy life? That's so Singer. Well, it's great. So, uh, How many more cars am I going to own in my life at this point? I'll probably own another like two, three cars in my life. You know, because I tend to keep cars for a long time. So I figure I should probably buy. Like, how about a Jaguar? I've started my countdown. I figure I've got probably another eight, eighty, eight to eighty thousand movies left to see. So I'll uh, I'll start counting down now. Okay, there's the Jaguar. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I trust the mechanics of a Jaguar. I feel there, like it'll be in no, the shop all the time. It will be. I could get a Mercedes. Mm. Maybe like an E-Class. Mm. No? No. I don't know if I trust those either. No. I said that Cadillac it was lame. It was American BS. Yeah, I don't like it. Uh, I've owned an Audi in the past. I did enjoy my Audi. They're great. I could get an A6. They're really good. could get an A6. Now, is that comfortable? Is that like, hey, okay. I want to drive my living room. I want to be sitting in my living room. I, if I could take my couch and put it in my car, I would do that. Everyone I know right now who who they pretty much they swear by the Audis. People they I know swear who, at them or swear they swear by them. They they say, they say basically the luxury Audis are the uh, they're what BMWs and Mercedes used to be. The Audi now is the deal. That's really? what I've heard. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Now the A6 is that that that's that's a potential. We're going to talk about movies. <laughs> Oh, you want to talk about Peppa Pig and, and your, 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 your whatever, and you, you do that all day. This is serious stuff. Uh, it's so depressing. I know it is. 
Well, let's, you know what? Uh, okay, let, let, let me know at gods at digicast.com. Well, yeah, seriously, bought. recommend some cars for Mark oh, or yes, start, a, start a thread. Um, <laughs> by, the, by the way, the, uh, so uh, did you see the new, you haven't seen the new Coen Brothers film. It's you know, okay, here's why I didn't see the new Coen Brothers film. Yeah. I've been waiting for that film forever because yeah. the two trailers were so funny. They are. Couldn't They're believe great. it. I was going out with this girl, and I said to her, hey, let's go to uh, the uh, new Coen Brothers film. She says, well, I could, but I have plans that night. And I said, okay, great. I'm not that into you anyway, so I'll go to the Coen Brothers film. You, you do whatever the hell it is you're doing. And I didn't say that, but yeah. I thought it. And then she says, but if you want, you can come with me to this thing that I'm going oh. to. So I'm like, well, the girl's asking me out. She's going to show you. It was like $50 a ticket to this yeah. thing. Yeah, actually, you would like it. It was downtown L.A. Sure. Yeah. at the Million Dollar Theater. They had uh, five local chefs give a, give a reading of some of their, their writings, mm-hmm. including Jonathan Gold, yeah. who was the Pulitzer Prize winning restaurant critic for the L.A. Weekly, sure. now the L.A. Times. Yeah. Uh, Roy Choi. Yeah. who single-handedly sure. started the entire food truck craze in Los yeah, Angeles. absolutely. And uh, three others. It was, 100, it was a 50 bucks a ticket. She was buying. She said, hey, just come with me. So I'm like, you know what? I got to go. She invited me. She paid. I'll get laid. Very which, nice. Which, which didn't happen, by the way. Okay. And so I wound up doing that instead of seeing the Coen Brothers film. Well, so, I'm sorry. That's a long way to go for... No, I did not see the Coen Brothers film. Well, we had a daddy-daughter uh, uh, birthday weekend, and we went to the San Diego Zoo in Disneyland. Lame. So there you go. Lame. Very fun. Lame. A lot of stuff at Disneyland, uh, <laughs> not operational. They're, uh, you know... You went to Disneyland? Yeah. Why? Because uh, be my daughter just turned three. Oh, freaking I kid. got to do Disneyland. She thinks she's so smart. She is smart. No, it's she's kinda, not. It's kind of terrifying. She's a freaking baby. Yeah, not anymore. Uh-huh. She's like, she knows what she wants all the time. And and the new thing, by the way, is not Peppa Pig anymore. Oh, good. It, the the people who created Peppa Pig moved on and created a new series, Moo-moo which is Moose. the new thing. Moo Moo Ben and Holly's Little Kingdom. <laughs> it's about a little elf, Ben Elf, and mm-hmm. Holly, who's a fairy, and they're best friends. Oh, he's, very he's a fairy, all right. Let and me they're tell very something. tiny. They're very tiny. And the Nanny Plum. It's all the same voices, same kind of animation, so mm-hmm. it's very familiar. Yeah, good. And, you know, Nanny Plum is ba- basically Miss uh, Rabbit is the voice of Nanny Plum. And you have to, I want you to remember that. There'll be a quiz next week. Now, can Who I does say, the voice of Miss Rabbit and Annie Plum? No one cares. Can I say that uh, when, I, when I look at a car, mm. all I care about is the size of the, of the uh, navigation screen. Mark, I'm going to roll through uh, our classic movie stack. There's a ton here. We got a lot of, we got a gigantic amount of really cool new stuff to talk about. Uh-huh. So, uh, real quickly, we're going to. Well, gonna I'm bur- getting another Snapple. You do that. This podcast brought to you by Snapple. So we got some compilation stuff, some uh, bargain compilation stuff here uh, that you might want to check out. Are you a fan of Mary, Mary Higgins Clark, who does all these these kind of cheesy uh, airport mystery novels? Uh, the uh, Mill Creek has given us five of her films, uh, which I've never seen. Cradle Will Fall, Lucky Day, Loves Music, Loves to Dance, All Around the Town, and Where Are the Children? Apparently a lot of people really dig these things. Uh, I, I've, I've seen uh, a little bit of uh, Where Are the Children. That's the only one. And uh, it has Jill Clayburgh in it and Max Gale, which I, I, I have some vague recollection of. Otherwise, you know, uh, I guess if, if, if she's a, a, somebody that you care about. You know what? Uh, also, from Mill Creek, Queens of Scream, four films. I know what you did last summer. When a Stranger Calls, Vacancy, and The Cave. You know what? Not bad films. And uh, The Cave especially is really actually quite good. Um, uh, the Cave got, a, a, like, no release at the time, and it's really, really unfortunate. Uh, but it's actually quite a decent little, uh, you know, it's one of the, these are all sort of youth-oriented chiller suspensers. But uh, The Cave is definitely worth checking out. That is the one that uh, just unbelievably stood out to me. All of these were made uh, by Mandalay or Screen Gems, you know, somewhere between 10 and 15 years ago. But The Cave is the one you want to check out. Um, also, The Alien Files, another four movies. Night Skies, Alien Hunter, Ghosts of Mars, The Day the World Ended. Low-budget sci-fi, not, not uh, horribly offensive. And then another uh, multiple collection, Divas, Triple Threat, Triple Feature, Swept Away, Glitter, and Made in Manhattan. What holds them together? These are movies that star... Um, singers who, well, really never should have been actresses. Uh, Madonna, of course, in Swept Away. Uh, And Jennifer Lopez in Made in Manhattan. Jennifer Lopez is not a bad actress, but why she made the movies that she did is really, really a mystery. And, of course, Glitter starred Mariah Carey, and it's just absolutely atrocious. Um, 
Locked and Loaded, another four movies uh, from Mill Creek. These are uh, all just heavy macho things. The Point Man, Attack Force, uh, The Hunt for Eagle One, and Walking Tall. And uh, then the last of these Mill Creek titles, uh, which is really interesting, Chop Kick Panda. Chop Kick Panda, plus three bonus films, Puss in Boots, What's Up, and Taffy Toes. Now, Chop Kick Panda and Taffy Toes by Little Penguin. These people have no shame. Happy Feet? Hey, let's make one called Tappy Toes. Uh, hey, you know what? Uh, Kung Fu Panda is in theater. Kung Fu Panda 3 is in theaters. Let's release something called Chop Kick Panda. Look, it's one thing when you're the asylum and you're making your obvious mockbusters and everyone understands that, you know, snakes on a train is the kind of a wink and a nudge. It's the, but this is taking advantage of children. A child will see this and think that this is Kung Fu Panda. Stop that. It's Maybe it's right. better than Kung Fu Panda. I'm not a fan of Kung Fu Panda. You know, just... That's just me. Not a big fan. Um, but, uh, and then uh, we got three here from the uh, Manufacture on Demand line of 20th Century Fox and MGM. They are, of course, released from the same. Uh, two Fox titles. Uh, Danger Has Two Faces and The Iron Curtain. Uh, Danger Has Two Faces is... Uh, you know, kind of a a mid level noir uh, with a decent cast, uh, directed by John Newland, and um, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, it's not one of the best things you've ever seen. The really, really good one is the Iron Curtain. The Iron Curtain is fantastic. Uh, Dana Andrews, Gene Tierney, just really. I don't know why this this was uh, shuffled over to the MOD line because uh, this was, this was a kind of a big deal back in the day. Directed by William Wellman, who of course did Wings, the very first Academy Award winner. And uh, this was a, um, you know, a Daryl Zanuck production in 1948, really, really sharp. Uh, one of the first films that kind of deals with the, uh, the nascent Cold War and uh, a lot of the espionage issues that were sort of really, really bubbling to the surface almost immediately after World War II. Sharp film. And uh, then from the 80s on the MGM limited, collection, uh, limited edition collection line is Foxfire Light. With uh, Leslie Nielsen basically playing it uh, shockingly straight, along with an aging Tippi Hedren and Faye Grant. Uh, this is just one of those 1980s mid-level sort of rural dramas set in the Ozarks. And it just, it, you know, it's one of those kind of middling small town things that, uh, it's all right. You know, it, belong, it really belongs to the 80s. It's not, nothing spectacular, but it's not, it's, it's inoffensive. And uh, then also on MOD, and definitely worth mentioning, before I uh, turn this over to Mark, is uh, the long overdue re-release on DVD. This has previously been out years ago. It was part of the Blackhawk Films Collection when they released through Image, and because they are now releasing through Flickr Alley, uh, a lot of these things are coming out again in MOD, but of course, beautiful, beautiful quality. And this is the 1914 silent classic Asunta Spina. Uh, starring Francesca Bertini, which is uh, a, a really a, an extraordinary cl- a silent film very few, few, very few people have seen. And uh, it's a nice, uh, nice example of a very particular kind of Italian silent film that is uh, absolutely worth checking out. So uh, beautiful work from, uh, from uh, the people at Flickr Alley. Go to flickralley.com to find out more. But uh, this, is a, this is a good little, good little highly intense, very melodramatic, hyper-theatrical uh, Italian silent film from 1914 starring a lovely actress, Francesca Bertini. So go check out Assunta Spina, A-S-S-U-N-T-A. Uh, yes, sir. Wait, Extraordinary Tales is a, um, it's a collection of... Uh, Five animated little shorts that are inspired by uh, the writings of Edgar Allan Poe. Got a great cast, voices, including uh, Bella Lugosi and Julian Sands and Roger Corman. Guillermo del Toro even uh, narrates one of them. This is, uh, it's kind of a um, law of diminishing returns on these. It's got this kind of clunky interstitial thing where this woman in a graveyard, she's like a statue, represents death and she has a conversation with a raven you know very Edgar Allan Poe yeah so happens to you know, everybody huh happens to everybody happens to me all the time so uh you know maybe this is fine for Halloween but at this point uh you know I, I like the fact that it's from a it's from a Spanish writer director uh Raul Garcia there's all sorts of great interesting stuff coming out of Spain right now uh, but ultimately only if you're a fan of Edgar Allan Poe would I give this a whirl uh we also have some criterions ladies and gentlemen do the criterions yeah Booyah. 
Bill and Ethan Cohen, speaking of uh, the Cohen brothers and Hail Caesar, we have Inside Lewin Davis, which is a terrific film. One of their smaller films, but still a, a mm. very rewarding film. I like this movie mm. a lot. It's about you know it's no. about uh, 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 Oscar Isaac, who uh, stars in the new Star Trek. Love Star Wars Oscar movie. Isaac. He um, he. <laughs> this film he, goes nowhere for me. You know what it is. His the thing is, is that I, what I liked about the movie is that essentially this guy Lewin Davis, who used to be part of a very popular uh, 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 folk duo, they were hanging out in the village in New York in the early '60s, and he's gone out on his own. And he's having a little bit of a problem, sleeping on couches, trying to get his music out there. What I liked about this film is that he sort Lewin Davis is sort of this sad sack musician who is always just one step behind the next musical thing. You know, he's 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 the guy who's like, he's not gonna be part of the sixties revolution that Bob Dylan started, but he'll at least he'll witness it. Yeah. And it, it, as you watch the film, you realize that. He's talented, and uh, but he just doesn't quite have his s together. Here's here's the thing: this the, the, the Coen Brothers for me, and I still love them, and I still like most of the movies they do. But there are movies like Lewin Davis and Burn After Reading, and uh, and I would put um, uh, Hail Caesar in there as well, where it feels like they just thought up a re- a bunch of funny bits for their friends and some cool like pastiche rips. Like everything in uh, uh, Hail Caesar is a is a mashup. Like every character is a ma- like the character played by George Clooney is basically a mashup of Charlton Heston and uh, what's his name from from Quo Vadis, the the the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the the Anthony Quinn. No, the guy from Quo Vadis with the no with uh, the, uh, Omar Sharif. No, um, with the with the with the square jaw. Yeah, you know the, 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 uh, hang on, I'm getting there. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. It's, um, no, hang on, hang on. I know. Uh, Peter Yusinov. No. No, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> anyway, but but you know what I mean? It's like Robert in, Taylor. Not Robert Taylor. No? No. Victor Mature. That's it. Victor Mature. So he's like a cross between Victor Mature and Charlton Heston. And, uh, you know, the uh, Josh Brolin character is like a cross between uh, uh, Irving Thalberg and, you know, s- some other studio production head and everybody's like a, a cross between something and something. And every movie is a cross between something and something. And it, it just, at a certain point you're like, is there a story here? Or am I just watching like a parade of, you know, how many genres from the 1950s can we recreate in a single movie? And it just kind of, I don't know. It just, they, I, they need to start putting more meat on the bones. They need to do what they used to do. They need to make stuff like Fargo and blood simple where there's just a lot going on. It's not just a lot happening. And there's a difference, you know? Anyway, enough. But I, I like Lewin Davis. I, I, I do, I too. Do. I just, it, I mean, I'm glad Criterion released it, and yeah. I'm sure I'll watch it again and enjoy many parts of it. And I love the whole cat bit, but it just, it's, it does, there needs, I need more meat these days. Uh, 4K digital transfer, uh, audio commentary, which is fine, but it does not feature the Coen brothers and uh, a bunch of other stuff, too. Yeah. Um, so I would definitely check that out. Also, we have uh, Rita Hayworth oh. in Gilda, oh. 1946. Fantastic. This is a uh, peak Charles perform- Vidor. This is, yes, a mm-hmm. peak performance from uh, Rita Hayworth. It's kind of the performance from Rita Hayworth. This is, like, when people think about Rita, they think about this. This is it. This is Rita Hayworth. Just, this is matinee idol stuff. It's a great movie. You know, the thing is that it's it's... A lot of these uh, famous stars from that era, you look at them, you're like, yeah, you're not hot. Maybe you were hot at the time, but, you know, you're not hot by modern standards. But you know what, Rita Hayworth? She's hot. Very sophisticated, very erotic. She's just really, she's just totally hot. And, uh, you know, she's totally sultry, and she plays uh, the, there's this, George McCready plays this criminal, and she's, She's the wife of this criminal, and she also has this former flame, played by Glenn Ford, and they both just completely lust after her, and it's kind of like a, these two guys are kind of really after her. Fantastic. And, and it's really great, and uh, it was directed by Charles uh, Vidor, and uh, put yeah. The, put the blame on MAME. That's the big song. Put the blame on MAME. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, yeah, my you know, my father knew Rita. His, my, her dad was my father's, uh, he taught dancing at my father's acting school. You remember my father taught Rita when she was a little girl. I used to hear those stories when I was growing up. She loved her. Everyone loved her. It was amazing, including Orson Welles. Boy, did he love her. Uh, yeah, well, yes. 
He loved her enough to marry her. He did. Anyway, uh, Edge of Seventeen by David Morton. Uh, this is a new HD restoration released on DVD, not on Blu-ray, but hopefully eventually on Blu-ray. Uh, this is like the the one of the great coming of age uh, gay films from the uh, the queer new wave period from uh, 1984. And uh, it's a sharp film. Uh, it's uh, this was released in, originally released in 1998, but it takes place in 1984. Make be clear on that. And uh, it's uh, it's it's really stylized, made for very little money, and um, it's it's a sharp film. It's really good and includes a, a conversation with the director and Todd Stevens, who uh, who wrote it. Some deleted scenes and trailer. It's uh, it's really really well acted and. Uh, if you watch Orange is the New Black, Leah Delaria is uh, is also in this. So that is out finally once again on DVD. Um, my pick of the week, uh, and there's a lot of good stuff this week, but my pick of the week has got to be the film that uh, changed movies, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, in its final incarnation before they do. By the way, we're a few weeks away from uh, from uh, uh, UHD Blu-ray releases. You realize that? First week in March is when the uh, the 4K Blu-rays hit the hit the market. Yeah, but you need a 4K TV. There will only be one 4K Blu-ray player at that time, the Samsung. So anybody playing them will be playing them on a Samsung. It's the only one. Oppo is not releasing one till later in the year. A lot of people aren't even coming out with them till the first quarter in 2017. So I'm not sure what the sales figures are going to be like for these things because a lot of people just aren't going to buy go out and buy the only Blu-ray player available. It's just not going to happen. Them. Yeah, I don't why, why would they? I mean, they, I, you know, people are feeling a little bit betrayed by Blu-ray yeah. only because, you know, uh, Blu-ray had its little moment, and then it became all about streaming. Yeah. And now they're trying to get you back into the into the package media <laughs> fold with, you with know, 4K. I've been reading a lot of these articles. Well, let me let me mention first. This is the uh, the first time that Snow White has been on uh, high def in any format whatsoever. This is the signature collection. Uh, Blu-ray, DVD, and digital HD, which, of course, is the Disney Anywhere uh, digital HD version. And, uh, look, I, what am I going to tell you? It's gorgeous. They preserve the, the look of the film, the grain, uh, the pristine, vintage look of Snow White. There's no, no excessive digital tweaking here. It just looks awfully good, but it still looks vintage, and it's perfect. And the audio is perfect. The remix of the audio is beyond belief how good it is. And uh, it's just breathtaking and wonderful and fantastic. And uh, lots of extras here uh, on on the the incredible pop culture phenomenon. You know, it's all featurette stuff. Um, Walt uh, talks about you know Walt himself does a little dip bit talking about uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. They they actually went and took his head out of the freezer and they reanimated it to get him to actually talk about the movie and share some memories before they threw him back in the Sub Zero. It's amazing what they can do today. It really is. Uh, and uh, there's a thing from um, uh, the Disney Channel where they talk about, you know, just fun facts. It's kind of more for kids. And then there's this alternate sequence, uh, strictly a storyboard construction, which is not amazing, but it's kind of a nice tidbit because nobody's ever seen it before. Anyway, really terrific. You know, do I really need to recommend Snow White? Just yes. go get it because otherwise it'll go back in the vault. And uh, playing for love, Mark. Playing for love. This is a. Um, this is what hap- has happened to Robert Townsend. He's playing for love. Uh, I. Uh, you know. I like Robert Townsend. I really do. I think he's a terrific actor. I think he's a really, really good director. Uh, he co-wrote this, and directed it, and stars in it, and co-produced it, and it's fine, you know. Uh, but it's not what he really should be doing. It just. It just kind of lacks that um, that edge that he used to have. He used to be able to sort of, ju- with his movies, juggle kind of an edge but a sweetness. There was sweetness with an edge and an edge with sweetness. And this is kind of tepid sweetness and uh, really no edge. Uh, but it's you know it's a it's a basketball romantic comedy. I mean, high school basketball romantic comedy. And he's he's charming, but I I'd like to see him do something that gets not just a straight to video release but a theatrical release again and. Really, kind of tries to push some buttons, and man, you know, you're you're a talented guy. Do do better work out there. Uh, and then uh, we got a cheesy thriller called Home Invasion, which is worth watching only because Natasha Henstridge still looks absolutely fantastic. No, she's got to be like fifty. You know what? She looks great. She really does. She looks great. Jason Patrick is in this, and he looks great too. I like him. David Tennant, you know, he's he's no slouch as a director. 
Um, it, but I mean, it's you know, it's it's a pretty boilerplate thriller. There's nothing nothing unusual about it. It's uh, you know, it, like thieves uh, targeting a mansion, and uh, you know, they get, get a lot of sort of you know, pe- women in jeopardy and tech stuff, and it. it you know, this, this, they, they make it like 50 of these a week. But it is perfectly competent, perfectly competent. I mean, all these people used to be, uh, you know, serious feature filmmakers, and now they're doing straight-to-video stuff. But uh, it's got some chills and thrills, and Natasha Henstridge hasn't aged, and Jason Patrick is still cool and completely uh, non-emotional. And Scott Adkins also in this. I, I thought it was I thought it was decent. I thought it was decent. Well, you know what's not decent is The no. Condemned 2, Way In 2007, there was a movie called The Condemned, oh. and nobody remembers it. And yet somehow they uh, made a condemned too. This is another WWE piece of crap. Stars uh, Randy Orton. These things and, make uh, money though, man. And Eric Roberts because you they know do. what? There's stupid people everywhere. They make money. This thing is this really lame combination of the most dangerous game and like reality TV. Yeah. You know, in the previous one, he had to he had to it was like a capture a gambling ring leader or something, you know, and now he's this guy's a bounty hunter and now he's a target in this most dangerous game ripoff, and I just think it's this stuff is just terrible. I know. Just a bunch of tattoos and gunfights. Yep. You know, surprise free, stupid Tattoos dive. and gunfights. That's your, that's your pull quote. Exactly. Tattoos and gun, gun no fights. No surprises, stupid dialogue. You realize that would be, a, they would really put that on the poster. Tattoos and gunfights. Boom. Mark Kaiser. They would. Seriously. Uh, hey, be, it's my claim to fame. It is. That's exactly what it needs to be. Uh, uncaged. Beware the beast within. Uh, you know, the, 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 the darn werewolf things just do not go away. They just keep, keep haunting us. Uh, anyway, this is, uh, this is another one of those kinds of deals, and it's pretty lowbrow. Very little money spent on this. It, uh, it, it, you know, I, I appreciate what they can do with very, very little money. Um, the, uh, but it doesn't, it really doesn't do anything new. It just doesn't. Uh, it's it's kind of it's sort of the same as everything else. But you know, on the plus side, this guy who directed it, Daniel Robbins, uh, he's got a little bit of style, so it's worth the uh, you know for genre fans, I guess there's something uh, interesting about it. But otherwise, t- completely no name cast, and uh, they do a decent enough job. But it's just you know it's the whole you know I am a werewolf and I didn't know it. Where what's my bloodline? Good grief! I mean, how many times? Uh, we also have uh, Are We There Yet? This is from 19, uh, actually, this is from 2005 with Ice Cube. This is one of the, f- this is one of the first films where you're like, oh, Ice Cube, you were like, you know, gangster rapper, you know. You were the man. You were, you're now now yeah. you're doing Are We There Yet? with a bunch of uh, rambunctious kids who are uh, bothering you. So, uh, you know, Brian Levant, he directed this. He's the, he's the kind of guy who directs these sort of very watered down, namby pamby, edgeless comedies. And uh, you know we're but we're today we'll I think we'll talk about a much much better film that uh, features or contains Ice Cube, but as for are we there yet? I just think this thing is just like child abuse. It's like a sitcom, yeah. really bad stuff. Who, who would have ever thought that he would have? Uh, speaking of Ice Cube, we'll, and we're going to talk a little more about him in a moment. But who ever thought that he'd become a family film guy? Right? I know. All right. The last. Uh, the last uh, of the. Uh, classic library things to mention. Uh, Just a few interesting titles here real quickly. Uh, This one is from Facets. It's called Disruptive Film, Everyday Resistance to Power Volume 1, which presumes that there will be other volumes coming out. And uh, this is a, uh, this is a, a, essentially a collection of four different uh, programs featuring 26 short form experimental nonfiction films that uh, span from 1914 up to about a decade, you know, a decade or so ago. Uh, and uh, if that makes sense to you, in other words, it's four programs compiled that are co- themselves compilations of short films that are sort of political protest films that span an entire century. And uh, you wind up, it's about four hours worth of stuff. And um, it is it ranges from being really annoying to very interesting to incredibly boring. But it is historically significant. Uh, uh, Jill Godmelow uh, co-produced this, and so you got some really good documentary cred here. Um, but man, it is—it's uh, kind of insanely globe-trotting, kind of unfocused for something that has m- been particularly uh, meticulously curated. So it, it's of interest to people who find the history of protest film interesting, but don't expect them to make it easy. It, you really have to dig through it. Uh, some people remember the 3D film coming at you. Oh, I remember this oh movie. Oh my gosh! Do you I remember do. That? 
Holy cow. Well, come no, on. No, come on. When that movie came out, we were like, oh, my God, it's awesome. It's going to come <laughs> at me. It'll be awesome. <laughs> oh, we, were hard. we were just the dumbest kids we, in the world. We, we really were. Uh, anyway, Coming At You is, uh, is out on, uh, on Blu-ray. And it, it, it with both 3D and 2D versions, and it's just it's just it's just ridiculous, but kind of enjoyable in its ridiculousness. Uh, this was actually directed by Ferdinando Baldi, who was a kind of a you know he, he did Django and a lot of other stuff. And I, I I don't think I knew that at the time. I don't think I realized that this was a uh, a, a, a spaghetti western guy who made this. But anyway, um, yeah, it, it's 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 schmaltzy, it's kitschy, it's uh, it's cheesy. Uh, it's clearly exploitative on a level that is just so shameless. You, it's almost inexcusable. But it is a cult film, and it's worth rediscovering because you'll just sit there, wide-eyed with disbelief that somebody actually made this. And especially now that 3D is, everyone's so cynical about all 3D. You look at this and you just think, "Wow, that that feels like something prehistoric." Uh, and then a couple from Shout Factory here, uh, from their Scream Factory line. David Carradine in Sunny Boy. This is the unrated version, which really doesn't mean much. It's uh, pretty much the same as the, uh, the theatrical release version. Uh, you know what? Um, here's the thing. Have, have you ever, Mark, did you ever see Sonny Boy? Nope. You have any, are you in any way familiar with Sonny Boy? Nope. Okay. Sonny Boy came out in 1989. What were you doing in 89? Uh, that you did not hear about Sonny Boy? I was probably watching a lot of Star Trek. Okay. Well, anyway. Uh, so effectively, this is kind of one of those, um, it's sort of somewhere, it's caught somewhere between Texas Chainsaw Massacre and, um, an acid trip. It is, uh, David Carradine plays a transvestite, which is Transylvania, which is a little ironic given how he died. And, uh, there's a, there's a whole, I, I guess the better way to say it, it's sort of somewhere between Friday the 13th, not Friday the 13th, but, um, Halloween, somewhere between Halloween and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Anyway, uh, it is, uh, it is truly, truly twisted and, and wrong and very disturbing. And, uh, it, it definitely comes from that whole kind of slasher, uh, psychopath film milieu. And it is, um, probably more effective than it really should be. And then the other one is Jack's Back, starring James Spader, uh, which is, uh, this is in a Blu-ray DVD combo pack. This is basically uh, Jack the Ripper, you know, come back, or some facsimile or imitation of him uh, now haunting people in L.A. And uh, the only reason to really watch this is because it's got James Spader and it's directed by Rowdy Harrington. That's it. Remember Rowdy? Rowdy, Rowdy Harrington. That's it. Rowdy, Rowdy Harrington. Uh, Awesome. And not to be confused with Rowdy, Rowdy Piper. No, the Rowdy Harrington... Rowdy Harrington, who did Roadhouse and a lot of other cheesy movies, uh, he wrote this and he directed it, and you can absolutely tell. But I'll tell you that I always enjoy, and by the way, Cassian always produced this. Isn't that funny? Uh, you, you can always, you, you just, you always find James Spader doing something that is just totally tweaked. Like he and Jeff Goldblum and uh, Christopher Walken all have those weird ways of reading lines that no one else will ever match. It's just brilliant. Did you did you see did you did you did you like the uh, the Jeff Goldblum and the uh, in the Independence Day? No, on the uh, playing the piano uh, going on up. Did you see that commercial during the Super Bowl? Yeah, but during the Super Bowl there was also the Independence Day trailer. Yeah, there was. That was great. Really, I'm was looking it? forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. I am. I, you know, at the end, it's just like like some enormous gigundous thing just smashes into the earth. What, what was Fine. that about? Fine, Gee, cool. Okay. If 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 that was <laughs> if if that was the Superman versus Batman trailer where like a gigundous thing falls into it, you'd be like that's terrible. Well, probably. Why are you yeah. giving Why are you giving Independence Day a pass? Because Zack Snyder's a horrible I human gu- being. Okay, I guarantee you, I know why that happened. So but here's what happens at the end of Independence Day, which yeah. I haven't seen. I don't know. Yeah. All I know is that at the end of the commercial, this enormous gigundous yes. ship that's as big as a gigantic, <laughs> as big as a galaxy, you know, destroys the Earth. Here's what happens at the end. I guarantee it. Yeah. At the uh, with 15 minutes left in the movie, uh, the Earthlings defeat the aliens, but they can't stop the ship from crashing into the Earth. That's what happens. I'm telling you. Okay. So they're going to defeat the aliens, but then for some reason the aliens are going to crash their ship into the even Earth. Even when he makes junk, I like Roland Emmerich's movies because he knows That's he's making junk. That's what I, I like. I, 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 I enjoy that. Anyway, so uh, so yeah, Jack's back. 
There you go. Meaning, uh, you know, Jack the Ripper. Um, all right, Mark, let's talk about uh, new movies. Let's talk about The One. This is very appropriate for Black History Month, and uh, this is the one that sort of set everybody off with the Oscar nominations. Why didn't this get more nominations? Let's talk about it. Uh, Straight out of Compton. There it is. Now I have to say that um, I don't like uh, I, I don't like rap music. I don't like NWA's music. Uh, I just never liked rap music. But I really like this movie. This movie is a it's uh, it feels very authentic, and you really got to hand it to um, uh, F. Gary Gray, a director I've had my eye on for a long time, uh, sp- starting with The Negotiator, but then he was kind of in movie jail for a while. But he really comes back with uh, this film. I think this is a great combination of social, political, and economic themes. I agree. Um, I like all the uh, actors in this film. I, I can't say I'm giving any of them Oscar nominations. I'm sorry, but I did like them all. Well cast. Uh, I, I, what I will say is that I think the arc of the film is a little... It, when you strip it down, the arc of the film yeah. is kind of standard. It's a rags to riches. It's another sure. rags to riches music story. And, and, but and what it, I liked is I, I, I liked the environment. I thought it was well captured. I found it very interesting, it very authentic. As far and it's a good movie. as as musical biopics go, I think this is definitely one of the better ones. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, this is one of the better ones. They all they're all kind of in the same ballpark. But I don't know. Did you ever see the uh, the Joe Sargent directed TV uh, movie uh, on the uh, the Temptations? That was that was Joe Sargent, right? I think. Am I right? The Temptations, the Joe Sargent thing. Would you like me to look that up for you, Wade? Because uh, yeah. I don't know what the top I'm of pretty my sure head. that was Joe Sargent. Well, anyway, great, great TV movie. I mean, really, really good. Phenomenally good. And um, th- this is b- pretty much in that same thing in terms of t- kind of tackling a very legendary group, rags to riches, the politics inside the group, uh, how they sort of deal with the uh, you know all the money aspects of the film business or, or the movie, the music business, the you know the uh, the racial aspects. I mean it. You know the cultural uh, changes that they go through. I mean, it, 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 it's it's definitely. I mean, obviously, the Temptations was uh, a lot lower I'm budget. I'm not finding this. You're not finding it. Okay, not Joseph Sargent. Thought, I thought it was Joe Sargent. Anyway, could be wrong. So, uh, but anyway, it, I think it's first rate. Really first rate. Straight out of Compton. Here's here's one. Here are a couple of reasons why I Is think this that, from 1998. Yeah, Alan Arkish. Alan Arkish. Alan Arkish. Alan Arkish. Hey, I just work here. It says Alan Arkish. Do the Temptations? Okay. So wow. He directed 66, uh, including, wow, this guy, this guy, this guy's been around. Oh, Arkish has been around forever. Anyway, I don't think it, I don't think it got a, uh, a Best Picture nomination for a lot of reasons, uh, mainly because of the way that they rank the, the Best Picture nominees. You know this, you have to get like 320 first place votes to be able to get a Best Picture nomination. So if you get like 4,000 second place votes and no first place votes and some other film gets 320 first place votes but, n- but nothing else, they wind up getting a Best Picture nomination and you don't. It's a, it's a real screwy system and it was designed basically to try to squeeze like a Dark Knight or a Batman versus Superman into there or a Transformers film into there so people would watch the show and then it wound up making the, you know, screwing over smaller films. But anyway, mm-hmm. I digress. You know what, Mark? Here's a film uh, that everybody everybody kind of defecated on uh, unfairly and wrongly, and I'm going to stick up for it because I think this is a great film. I think this is one of the best films of the year. Uh, Burnt with Bradley Cooper. You're just saying that to I'm me, Waves. I'm not. Uh, directed by John Wells, written by Stephen Knight. These are not slouchy people. Well, Stephen okay? Knight's the man. Stephen Knight is totally the man. Stephen Knight is one of the great screenwriters of our day. I mean, you know, I, th- sorry, you know, Locke was phenomenal. He wrote and directed oh, Locke, love which is which love is it. great. Yep, Dirty Pretty Things, oh, lots of other. Great. I mean, great stuff. Anyway, so um, this is basically the story. You know, Bradley Cooper plays a guy who's a Michelin chef who's had a drug problem, and his life is in complete spiral. He's not really a chef anymore, and he decides he's 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 done his penance and he wants to open up a restaurant and get that get that last Michelin star that he never got. I mean, he's you know, and he goes back to London and he tries to you know j- just kick it and and get it going and uh Sienna Miller is this kind of sous chef that he pulls in and they have this adversarial relationship and on and on and on it is a this is a great movie it is a great character study and it is really well done the scenes in the kitchens are phenomenal the food is incredible and the script is really, really, really good. I mean, it is unbelievably well-crafted. The characters, the relationships, the rivalries, all the stuff. This is just such a well-done film. And everybody just poo-pooed this film. And I, and I tried to think, I was like, why is everybody so determined to hate a film 
that so clearly works on every conceivable level. I enjoyed this more than almost any other movie I saw this year. I really did. I enjoyed every second of this film. It just totally talked to me. And I thought, okay, here's why. Number one, I love movies about cooking. I do. I love movies about chefs. Uh, You know, mostly Martha, all that stuff. I, I love them. Second of all, I think people are so jaded by the whole celebrity chef scene, they don't really appreciate what chefs do. Like, they think that, oh, oh, am I supposed to mourn for you? Oh, I feel sorry for you, you poor, rich, celebrity Michelin chef. These guys aren't rich. You, you're getting, it's not like a Michelin star equals a billion dollars. These guys, like, work their butts off to get those stars, and then they still run their restaurants, and they still have to go to work every day, and they still have to grow and cook the food and run. The, I mean, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's nice to get that star, but it doesn't make you rich. You don't become Wolfgang Puck. Those guys are very few and far between. The ones who have Michelin stars are still work-a-day, everyday chef guys, and very few of them actually wind up being incredibly wealthy. It is a lot of work and a lot of love for very little return. you got to really be into it. And, uh, it, you know, it wastes a few people who, who should be uh, in better movies. I mean, frankly, they, you know, they're, they're not given a terrible lot to do. Like Omar C., great actor, doesn't have a lot to do here. Uh, he's kind of in it just to, to, because, you know, he's one of the guys of the moment. Um, Emma Thompson kind of wasted as a you know sort of a therapist role sort of like what are you doing in this movie um, and, you know but otherwise it's uh, it is you know apart from wasting a few really really good actors Daniel Bruhl phenomenal in here phenomenal as the son of a restaurant owner I love this movie I love this movie I urge everybody to check it out great commentary with John Wells uh, and the uh, executive chef consultant, some deleted scenes, and uh, a little uh, a little thing with Bradley Cooper in the kitchen. Really good movie. Deserves to be discovered. You will not regret it. You will thank me. Uh, Wade, uh, you'll thank me because I'm telling you not to go see Black Mass. I, n- I know you're going to see Black Mass, everybody. I saw Black Mass. I, n- I, n- I know you're going to rent it on a yeah. Saturday night. I have to say I did not I did not buy this movie. I didn't buy it. I, everybody's playing dress up. I'm tired of the whole, like, you know, Brotherhood of Violence thing. And I just feel like Johnny Depp was like late to the game playing a character like this. And uh, I didn't buy the hair. I didn't buy the sunglasses. And I just feel like everybody's just, it's just, it's just the whole thing just felt phony to me. Uh, you know, based on a true story, of course, Whitey Bulger, you know, it's a big deal. Sat in this takes place in, in Boston in the 70s. True story. I, I get it. I think everything in this movie is really good, except Johnny Depp is an overactor. And, and it was funny because you, well, you were on the email chain where Ray made the analogy. He said he reminds me of William Shatner in The Deadly Years, the Star Trek episode. <laughs> and then I went and dug up the photo with the exact same hairline. <laughs> it is. The best. Yep, yep. He has the same hairline as Captain Kirk in The Deadly Years when he's losing his hair. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, the, the funny thing about Whitey Bulger, um, a good friend of mine who is a uh, he's an old screenwriter, uh, used to write for Kung Fu, and he he was living at the time. He was he was head writer on the for Kung Fu for for he wrote like the final episode of Kung Fu. Anyway, um, is that where Kung Fu qu- quits to open up a Chinese restaurant? Yeah. Anyway, he was uh, and still does at the time was living in the same building as Whitey in Santa Monica. Used to see him every day up and down the elevator. Hi, how you doing? Nice to see you. Good. Have some have have a good time. See you tomorrow. Every day for years and years and years and years and years. It wasn't until he came home one night and there's like just SWAT teams and cops surrounding the building that he realized that that guy, that nice guy he'd see in the elevator and his wife every day was Whitey Bulger. Can you believe that? Uh, I don't. I think you're making it up. I'm not. Um, so he, wait, here's the situation. Yes. So when we voted, Lafka, when we voted, mm-hmm. uh, we have our Next Generation Award. Yes. Now, uh, everybody was talking about two films that were kind of going neck and neck for Next Generation. Mm-hmm. Uh, Creed... And Diary of a Teenage Girl. Now, I abstained from the vote. Why? Because mm-hmm. I did not see either Creed, which, which I still have not seen, yeah. or Diary of a Teenage Girl. So I abstained from the vote. Only a couple weeks later, because uh, it was on Netflix, that I finally see Diary of a Teenage Girl. And I have to say, I love this movie. I hate it. This is a great movie. Creepy. <laughs> it's creepy. <laughs> You know, the, what do you want? it's creepy. The only th- the only thing I will say about the only thing that bothered me about the film is that I felt like it, it's about it's about this girl who has sex for the first time and it kind of changes her life and she's got a bit of a compromised uh, uh, you know a background at home. Uh, uh, Kristen Wiig plays the mother. I will say that Christopher Malone, uh, um, uh, not the, the other one, Alexander Sarsgaard, yeah. who plays mm-hmm. the mother's boyfriend, yep. who has an affair with the teenage girl. Uh huh. I felt like Sarsgaard. He he wasn't quite sure how to play it. Does he mm-hmm. play it as a pervert, 
or does he play it as a guy just take just swept away by circumstance? I, I, I felt like he didn't quite get it. maybe maybe he maybe he was a little afraid of the character. He's so wrong. But otherwise, I think this thing is terrific. I think it's 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 raw. It's emotional. It's complicated. It never felt purient to me. I feel that the girl is great. Uh, this uh, Belle Powley, she's terrific. She is great, but the movie's creepy. <laughs> it's creepy. I'm sorry, it's creepy, and you know it's creepy. No, it's not. It's creepy. Uh, directed by a woman, by the way, Mariel Heller, which is always nice to see. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I would highly recommend <laughs> Diary of a Teenage Girl. It's freaking creepy. It's based on a, it's based on a uh, graphic novel. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh yes, it is. All right, uh, here I'm going to burn through uh, through a few things that you can you can probably forget about pretty quickly. So here we go. All right, we've got a little marathon going. Stonewall, where pride began. As long as we're talking about Roland Emmerich movies, uh, Roland Emmerich, of course, a is a gay man, but has never sort of been a gay director. He's never made gay films. So he, but he felt he felt you know he's made a, a, a few films that kind of verged on being like real movies and not just let's blow up a bunch of stuff and load the, lard out the screen with CGI. Um, one of which was Anonymous, which I love. Everybody else hated that. It's another one that I thought was a really great movie, and people just didn't sort of didn't get it. I thought Reese Ifans should have had an Oscar nomination for that. But anyway, so he decided, okay, I'm going to make a movie about the uh, the Stonewall riots, you know, where the gay rights movement began. And uh, oh my gosh, what a missed opportunity! Uh, this is just a this is just a giant mountain of cliches. It is it is just it needs such a better movie here. Um, it just isn't good. I'm sorry. It's just not good. I wait. Yeah. I you, bumped the mic. You bumped the mic. That's okay. This just really isn't good. Uh, it, it, it's sort of a it, – it just uses every cliche in the book. It invents this character played by Jeremy Irvine who's kind of like this, you know, all-American corn-fed boy who, you know, uh, winds up running – He basically his dad's the football coach. Aren't they always the sons of the football coach? And he has like a gay affair with the quarterback and uh, a gaffer. Yeah, gaffer. And then the quarterback, you know, is like, "Well, man, I'm not gay." And his dad's like, "You're no son of mine." And they kick him out of his small town, and he's an outcast. And here he goes with his little James Dean face and outfit, and he runs to, he runs to, you know, the uh, the outcasts, and and there he is, and oh, it, 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 it becomes it, part of the Stonewall riots. In it New hits York. it on the nose. It hits it on the nose. You even have that scene where you know you somebody walks in thinking they're going to see somebody, and then they see that person dancing with and kissing someone else and cut to horrified reaction shot oh my gosh do you really are you really doing that to me uh, but that said uh, Johnny Beauchamp does an unbelievable job in a great great supporting role uh uh, Matt Craven is pretty good Ron Perlman is kind of hilarious and uh Jonathan Reese Myers is not bad so uh you know it, there are some good performances here despite the fact that it's just otherwise really really cliched uh, Hellions, directed by Bruce McDonald, is just a completely ridiculous and totally laughable IFC Midnight uh, horror film. It really wants to be just one of those incredibly chilling Halloween movies, but it winds up not being very interesting at all. Uh, and it's, it, it is most uninteresting because it just wastes every single decent actor in it. Uh, and I, I, I just... I. I I don't know how these things get made, but I guess they get made inexpensively. So you can stay away from Hellions. Um, you can also stay away from uh, Zombie Fight Club, which is uh, really a movie that exists only because somebody thought up the title and then they felt obligated to actually have to invent a movie that lived up to the title. Uh, written and directed by Joe Chen, who apparently appears to have some kind of aspirations to just make a whole lot of really bloody, horrible, and disgusting movies for the rest of his career because that's all this has going for it. Uh, this is just dreadful. So I would not recommend this on any level whatsoever. Uh, it, it's just it's just dreadful, absolutely dreadful. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, a uh, faith-based film, Born to Win. Uh, again, really cliched. Just totally, totally, just absolutely plays it right on the nose, like most of these films do. Uh, you know, it's uh, dealing with the uh, with a guy who has a big crisis of faith and uh, goes on a you know a, a really difficult journey, seeing if he can sort of figure out what he really believes. And of course, he does not wind up being an atheist. And uh, let's see, a couple other ones here. Uh, oh gosh, I'll get these three out of the way. Let's get these four out of the way. Last Witch Hunter with Vin Diesel. This thing tanked. It deserved to. Did you see this, Mark? 
No. Horrible. Why would I see that? Horrible. Vin Diesel, lots of CGI. That's it. That's all it had going for it. Totally horrible. Elijah Wood, wasted. Michael Caine, wasted. It's, it's, it's just a lot of CGI, and Vin Diesel plays a witch hunter. That's it. It's the worst. Uh, the 33. Did you see the 33? I did see the 33. You know, it's it, it, my problem is that uh, it's a very affecting story. It can't not affect you. No. Because it's, so, it's, it's such a tragic story, even though obviously they all survived. It's still a tragic story. Yeah. I just felt that uh, uh, that the woman who directed it, and again, it's a great to see Patricia a woman. Patricia Reagan. It's great to see a woman mm-hmm. direct a film like this, yeah. like especially a film like this. Well, she's that, a very good director to begin yeah, with. It's, yeah, it's refreshing. I just felt like she didn't really bring a lot to it. It no. was a little on the nose. Well, Mike Medavoy optioned the story of the uh, Chilean miners right after it happened. And Mike Medavoy, amazing guy. Great studio executive, great producer. He was even a wonderful assistant soccer coach when I was a teenager. Fantastic. I didn't know who. Wait, hang on, say, wait, wait. What, what, what was that noise? It sounded my uh, name dropping. Was that you name? Yeah, dro- yeah. I, I can I can bring the picture. Uh, me with the big hair and the soccer team. And, Please uh, don't. Yeah. God anyway, help us. God help us all. Yeah, his son Brian Medavoy was a really good player on the team. You know, I was a, I played a halfback on the team. It was good. Lame. We won Lame. a lot of won a lot of games. Lame. Anyway, Mike Medavoy, great guy. Um, but he's a studio guy. He really only knows how to do studio level films. And uh, so you wind up hiring basically a whole bunch of European actors to play Chileans, which it's like Antonio Banderas. Okay, he's Spanish. I'll buy it. Gabriel Byrne? He said, what? Wait, was Juliette Binoche? Juliette Binoche. What? Juliette Binoche? What? what? With a Latin accent? What are you kidding I me? Know, that was With that like dyed hair? What are you doing? <laughs> Stop it. Are you kidding me? I know. Gabriel Byrne, he's Irish. What are you what are you trying to get away with? It's always here? nice seeing Gabriel Byrne. I've always liked him, but it's yeah, uh, I just it, 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 he's it, not it, a, I don't know why no, he's in there. It didn't work. Anyway, but I mean, you know, he's and trying the, to, he, he's trying to Hollywood gloss it up. And all the dream sequence, the hallucinatory stuff. I mean, look, it's a really well intentioned film. It's enormously well done. I mean, one, the one, one of the last it, James Horner scores, by the way. Yeah, the scale of it is huge. I mean, people don't realize it's not like these guys crawl into a little mine shaft to go there's like a city under there. Yeah, they have like giant heavy machinery, like miles underground. I mean, this thing was a real catastrophe. Uh, I mean, it's a decent film, but it just it doesn't quite work. And then Jack Black in the horrible feature film Goosebumps. Oh my gosh, this is like Jumanji, you know, with special needs Jumanji. This is horrible. It really, it, this is not a good film, and I don't know who thought this was a good idea. I mean, the TV series is, is bad enough, and this is just relentlessly poor, and sticking Jack Black in it really just doesn't work at all. So anyway, enough with the goosebumps. And then I'd like to take the Canadians to task for this movie, uh, Turbo Kid, which is like a, it, it clearly uh, aspires to be a certain kind of cheesy 80s film, like Time Rider, it's very much in that vein, the music, the look, everything. It wants to be kind of a low-level... Uh, it, it, imagine, like, if somebody did uh, a, 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 a remake of The Road Warrior, but as a cross between Megaforce and Time Rider, in which people don't have cars, but they have bicycles. And Michael Ironside is the bad guy yeah, with an eye patch. Yeah, he's awesome. And the hero is a kid. Uh, who aspires to be Turbo Kid, and he finds you know the turbo suit, and there's a whole comic book angle. It's, Sounds it's, dreadful. It is dreadful. But the worst part of it, the worst part of it is it's gory beyond all comprehension. If this were just kind of like a family film, like it intends to be, you're like, oh, yeah, it's a family film. But it's just relentlessly gory. Mm. It is so brutal. Well, now I want to watch it. It's so, it's just blood and sinew, and it's just, it just, it, it, it's so overboard. And I don't, I don't know who decided that that was a good idea. Anyway, this is an unbelievable Blu-ray DVD uh, three-disc ultra turbocharged collector's edition aimed at people who must love this movie on a level that I can't even comprehend. It is, it's just larded out with bonus features, uh, documentaries and featurettes and all kinds of stuff. And I, I have to imagine maybe in Canada this has a following? What's going on, What's going on up there? Turbo Kid. Oh, my gosh. You know, if, if it was about a Jewish kid, it'd be called Turbo Yid. Yeah. And I can say that because I'm Jewish. <laughs> uh, wait, uh, we have, uh, here's the thing. Now, when I saw Truth, I thought, wow, Kate Blanchett, another Oscar for her. She is magnificent. I love everything she does. However, uh, mm-hmm. my, my issue with Truth is that uh, it does not live up to its title. You know, this obviously is the story of uh, Dan Rather and his producer, Mary Mapes, and the, uh, the report they did on 60 Minutes about uh, former President George Bush's uh, service or lack of service. And, um, you know, I think that story, I guess, is worth telling. My problem is that the whole movie is sort of meant to rehabilitate the reputation of Mary Mapes, and I don't want to see that. 
Um, I don't want to be told that uh, she really was a crusader. I want to be told uh, the truth, which is that she's a wonderful producer who screwed up. And uh, that's the story, as far as I'm concerned. Yep, it's not. It's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's kind of a whitewash. The movie is. Yeah. You know, but again, uh, uh, Kate Kate Blanchett is just. I just love her. She no, I agree. she does no wrong. Uh, Dan, um, you know, uh, there are very few people who can play Dan Rather who can sort of uh, they can embody that Matt Rushmore like thing that Dan Rather really does have. And Robert Redford is one of those actors, and I and I, I I think it's good. He's he's got this. He's got that aura. Um, Dennis Quaid is also good in it. Topher Grace annoys me in everything he does, so he annoys me here. And uh, yeah, so you know what? It's uh, it's a bit of an acting clinic. If you want to see um, uh, Kate Blanchett and Robert Redford go at it, uh, there's a lot a lot of a lot of pleasures there to be had. But otherwise, I think this uh, movie, as Wade says, is a bit of a disappointing uh, whitewashing. Uh, a couple of animated films here. Uh, one outstanding. One kind of huh. The uh, Oscar-nominated Shaun the Sheep movie, which my daughter cannot get Meh. enough of. This was my daughter's first movie in a theater. Uh, it was. Really? Yeah. Aww, first movie in a theater. For all eternity, she and, didn't know uh, it. it was also her second movie in a theater. Oh, jeez. It was also her third movie in a theater. It was also her fourth movie Wait, in a so theater. Wait, so did she fall asleep in the theater for eight no. hours, or did she no. see it five no. times? No, no, she saw it four times. Okay. Four times in the theater. Uh, and she's seen it probably eight or nine more times on, on Blu-ray uh, already. It is, it's ridiculous how much she loves Shaun the Sheep. Uh, she got a bunch of stuff for Christmas for Shaun the Sheep. She got a little padded Shaun the Sheep. She got a Shaun the Sheep pin from Charles Solomon, which he was very nice enough to give to us. She got a Shaun the Sheep uh, uh, shirt. It's it's crazy how much she loves Shaun the Sheep. Anyway, Shaun the Sheep, of course, is a character that was uh, introduced by the Ardman animators in A Close Shave, the Wallace and Gromit short, and then became so popular they turned it into a TV series uh, that ran for two seasons and then, uh, of course, into an animated film, which came out this last year, and it is brilliant. The whole thing, like the TV series, is all pantomime. It's all very much in the silent film vein. Characters just sort of grunt and pantomime. There's no dialogue. So it's wonderful. And basically, the farmer from the TV show uh, ends up in the big city and gets amnesia. And then the sheep uh, and, of course, the dog, Bitzer, have to go and try to track him down and find him and, you know, put their farm family back together again. Brilliant, funny, clever, beautifully animated. There's nothing bad I can say about this. A lot of fun stuff on here behind the scenes and uh, featurette stuff. But basically, if you got kids, this thing is just a fantastic 85-minute ride that they will watch over and over, and you'll love watching it with them. Uh, Khalil Gibran's The Prophet is uh, a bit of an oddity. Uh, this was like a passion project um, that uh, kind of, well, if you did you ever read The Prophet? You know, I never did. You never did. I never did. Didn't read was, in school was, or you know what? It, it was too heady for me. Yeah, it was all that mystical blah blah. Yeah, well, it's it. you know, this is a book that was a, a bigger deal in the kind of oh seventies, really more than anything, sixties and seventies, I guess. Uh, and Salma Hayek, of course, was very very moved by it, as a lot of people are. And uh, Gibran, of course, was a a, um, a Lebanese writer and poet and and thinker and philosopher, and wrote this uh, this book that was essentially about you know a it was sort of a, a grand allegory slash parable about a guy who's a writer and who, who's you know oppressed and persecuted. And um, uh, this has it has a lot of interesting. Basically, every single one of the um, you know it, there's his story and there there are all of his little stories that he tells. And there is a different animator who animates each of the stories that he tells. And then of course a central animation team who narrate who animate the story of the prophet himself and, you know, his persecution and struggle. I mean, it's very ambitious, and it's very interesting. It's just you don't walk away going, wow, I'm blown away. I've just seen the new, the, the next best thing to slice bread. I, I've just seen a complete amazing reinvention of animated filmmaking. It doesn't really do that. It's just, it's a nice experiment. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's an engaging film, but it doesn't really do anything amazing. So, um, anyway, I can recommend it, but not heartily. Uh, probably worth, you know, a rental more than anything else. But anyway, there's an interview with the filmmakers and an animatic and uh, a little behind-the-scenes featurette. But otherwise, that is a Blu-ray, DVD, and ultraviolet combo set of K- Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. So, we're, you know, it's, it's a thing. And then... Um, <laughs> so, it's a thing. It's a thing. Now, that's a pull quote. Thank you. It's a thing. It's a thing. Meh. It's a thing. Uh, our brand is Crisis. What a waste this is. Uh, Sandra Bullock and Billy Bob Thornton and Anthony Mackie. 
this is uh, essentially based on the uh, the documentary, the Oscar nominated documentary, Our Brand Is Crisis, from whatever it was, twelve or thirteen, fourteen years ago, uh, which was all about uh, how a a group of American political consultants head down to South America to sort of pull the levers and bring all of their nefarious expertise to try to sway a, uh, a Latin American election, including James Carville. And Billy Bob Thornton, Thornton, this is you know sort of a loose adaptation of that story. Billy Bob Thornton essentially plays James Carville for the second time in his career because he sort of did a facsimile of Carville in primary colors, if you remember. So this is the second time that he's gone to that well. And he does it great. He does it really well. He's creepy and he's bald and you know he's southern and I guess that's all you need to do. Uh, Sandra Bullock plays the star, which is she's you know his arch nemesis and they've uh, she's never won an election against him and it's fairly cynical and uh, but otherwise it's just not very interesting. It doesn't really do anything that that is dramatically compelling and it is an unfortunate misfire for producers George Clooney and Grant Heslov, but particularly for director David Gordon Green who just cannot find a groove in his career to save his life. He does all he just throw he just throws stuff against the wall. I just don't I don't get it. Richard start, Linklater is a little like that too but he's had a lot more success. Yeah, but but Green doesn't seem to be he doesn't seem to be able to sort of find his no. his groove, you know. He's it's just sad. It's really sad. And then uh Ballerina's Tale before I turn this back over to you, uh Ballerina's Tale, The Incredible Rise of Misty Copeland uh on Blu-ray. This is um this is okay. Uh if you're not familiar with Misty Copeland, she's the she's sort of the first um she was the first um, – this is another Black History Month title that is sort of worth mention. She was the first black uh, principal dancer of the American Ballet Theater. And uh, this, is, uh, this is actually a lovely look at how she was able to sort of beat not only the cultural stereotypes in her own culture but those in predominant white ballet culture – to fulfill her dreams, and uh, there are lots of you know uh, ups and downs along the way, and uh, it is uh, it is a lovely story. So, um, a ballerina's tale, the incredible rise of Misty Copeland, definitely worth it for uh, certainly for this month because it's her story isn't told often enough. Wade, yes, do some movies. Yep, Bridge of Spies. That's finally out on Blu-ray, yeah. and uh, I enjoyed this film very much. This is you know I what this love is this Spiel- film. This is Spielberg. This is him doing uh, – this feels like Spielberg doing like old school, 50s, not quite Stanley Kramer, but 50s old school studio filmmaking. I agree. You know? I agree. And there's nothing wrong with that, and it's, it's nice to see. Such a good script. I mean, it's it really, really is. It's a really good script. It's a really good script. You know, it's uh, Tom Hanks and Mark Rylance, who is uh, – they're both uh, – he's nominated for an Oscar. It's, uh, it's, it's intricate. It's realistically scaled. It uh, looks great. You know, it's 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 exciting, but it's not exciting in that, you know, chases and fireworks kind of a way. You know, it's just sort of the the excitement is very much like kind of internal. Mm-hmm. You know, is he going to like the whole climax of the movie is whether the guy can walk across a bridge. Yep. That's the climax of the movie. And yeah. you know what? That's OK. Yeah. It's nothing wrong with that. No. So uh, I like the this whole Gary, the whole Gary Powers thing, the shooting down to the U2. How they're going to, you know, do the tra- – I, I, it's just – it's a great story. I mean, it's sad because you realize this is the first time that Steven Spielberg has had a film nominated for Best Picture where he was not nominated for Best Director. This is the first time ever that has happened to him. Ever. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that just shows you that – Changing if, of the guard. True. But also, if they didn't expand it – if they didn't expand the Best Picture slots to upwards of 10 – Would it have been nominated? This might not have been nominated. No. I don't think it would have been. Yeah. I don't think it would have been. But anyway, it's – you know, anyway – uh, you know what's not good is uh, Love the Coopers. Now, Love the Coopers. You don't love the Coopers? No. It's got no. a good cast. Who, who doesn't love Alan Arkin? John Goodman's in it. Anthony Mackie's in it. Ed Helms is in it. Uh, you know, uh, this thing, it's about this Christmas Eve celebration, and the whole family comes together. And, of course, they have to rediscover how much they really love each other. Mm. I've only seen that story 175 billion times. You know what? If you're going to watch this story, I, you're better off rewatching uh, uh, Home for the Holidays, directed by Jodie Foster, which I much, love. Much better. It's a good movie. This is just weak laughs and a lame script and very episodic and just kind of stupid humor. And I just, it's just very formulaic. And I just feel it just completely wastes a good cast. Jesse Nelson uh, directed this, and I just really there's no spark, there's no heat. It's really formulaic. I mean, look, who doesn't want to see Diane Keaton? And Olivia Wilde's in it, too, but I just think it's a total waste. Too bad. Uh, Mission Possible. 
No, this is not Mission Impossible. This is MI5. <laughs> Wait, I thought you had me Mission Impossible. No. I didn't see this. I know. <laughs> Peter Firth and Kit Harrington. Who are these people? I know. They all excited. I love me. I love the new Mission Impossible. It's I, great. I, had, I, I knew. I knew you were going to have that that reaction to it because that's the reaction. <laughs> that <came in>. It's <laughs> terrible. This thing was released. Do you, know, do you do you remember this being released? No. Yeah, this thing was released for like a week. Last year, it literally came out MI5. It's like it, it 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 came and went. It was it was, and they intentionally do this. Here's the thing. Look at this. It looks just like the it looks just like the Mission Impossible uh, cover art. Yeah, absolutely. No, they 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 intentionally designed this to be completely deceptive, to look like a Mission Impossible film. They want to they want to lure people in and think, oh my gosh, Mission Impossible? No, nope, MI5. A couple of people you never heard of in a really, really bad spy movie uh, that will never be a franchise, uh, and they just they just spat this thing out, and it, it's a it, you know it's just it's a it's a kind of a dumb terrorist plot movie. It should have been straight to Blu-ray, straight to DVD, whatever. It sh- it never should have been released in theaters. But they figured, you know what, the Mission Impossible movie with Tom Cruise had just come out, and maybe we'll get a little bit bleed over of people who think they're going to see Mission Impossible, and then they realize that they're not, but they're too lazy to actually get out of their seats. So we'll make a few bucks. Uh, Wade, you know what didn't make a few bucks? Suffragette. Now, Suffragette, uh, by the way, not the David Bowie song. Oh, David Bowie, Suffragette City. Uh, this had pedigree written all over it. This is uh, Helena Bonham Carter and Carrie Mulligan and uh, Meryl Streep. But i got to say, this is it's an, obviously a very important uh, moment in American history that is uh, rendered really about as dull as the most Brit- boring British, history. British history. I mean, British history, but yeah. uh, pretty much rendered about as dull as you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, you bet. You know what? This basically takes one song from Mary Poppins and then tries to turn it into a whole uh, non-musical drama, and uh, it's just not good. I mean, Carrie, look, Carrie Mulligan is wonderful, but as this beleaguered housewife and factory worker who is sort of pulled into the whole suffragette movement, and it's it's meant to be this big rousing. Kind of a civil rights thing, but it, thin it, characters, it's formulaic, just, oh, lame. And it's just so so dull, and it just draws on. And I kept thinking, you know what? This is basically made in Dagenham, except not entertaining. Like Sally Sally Hawkins and Made in Dagenham, which is based on the on the you know the the Ford uh, factory strike um, in Dagenham, England, is, is essentially the same kind of movie, except it's riveting. Made in Dagenham does everything right that this film does wrong. Uh, Everest it was. Uh, I, I have no objectivity on this. Uh, a very good friend of mine was an executive producer on this, so I'll, I'll just tell you. I think this movie is really cool, and I think the. Uh, I think it's 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 gritty and dramatic and uh, a really grown up way of making an action film. This is like the most mature action film that that I, I saw all of last year. I don't know why it didn't do better. Universal kind of didn't seem to have a whole lot of faith in it. The effects are fantastic. And uh, the characterizations are, are just really, really, really strong. I, I thought, you know, everybody in this did a fantastic job. Um, th- this is the story of a particularly deadly Everest um, uh, party, an Everest mountain climbing party from some years ago. And uh, it, was, it was just an unbelievable cat- uh, catastrophe. But the, what this does well is it doesn't sort of try to push your face into all of the visceral uh, activities of, of scaling Everest. It really, really tries to make you feel for the people and their families and the relationships and the stresses and the tensions and everything that goes on here. I thought it was, a, I thought it was really, really sharp. So um, I'm going to recommend Everest, which comes in a Blu-ray 3D, Blu-ray DVD, and ultraviolet combo set. Uh, Josh Brolin, Jason Clark, John Hall. Hawks, Kira Knightley, Robin Wright, Emily Watson, Jake Gyllenhaal. I mean, everybody in here is great except for Sam Worthington, who's just kind of always lame. But I, I thought Everest was fantastic. Well, it's nice to know that Sam Worthington – actually, I think Sam Worthington played the mountain because he's so emotionless, he might as well just play a mountain. The, the mountain – yeah, the mountain was more interesting than, than Sam Worthington. I think Sam Worthington played the mountain. Sam Worthington, I don't think he takes – And his through, dog spot. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Nobody outside of L.A. gets that joke. <laughs> Anyway, what else, Wade? Oh, what else? Uh, we got a few left. Just a few things. Uh, let me go here. Uh, Man up is a a, a, a perfectly amiable um, romantic comedy, kind of in the Harry Met Sally vein with Simon Pegg and Lake Bell. Um, essentially, and Lake Bell, I don't particularly like really, as an actress or as a filmmaker, but she puts on a British accent here and is just wonderful. Uh, essentially, the idea here is that Lake Bell um, 
is mistaken for Simon Pegg's blind date. She picks up the book. She meets a woman on a plane. She's having a certain life crisis, and she picks up. A, a, she meets a woman on a plane and uh, winds up with that woman's book. And the book was the cue for a blind date. And instead of when she, Mike, when Simon Pegg mistakes her for his blind date, instead of saying, "Oh, I, I'm not the woman. I'm supposed to return her book," she winds up playing along with it. And uh, the rest is somewhat formulaic, but. It's really sweet. They're, for, for whatever reason, Lake Bell and Simon Pegg have this unbelievable chemistry, and it's, it's fantastic chemistry, and, they, and it works. So I, uh, you know, it's a little tiny romantic comedy that nobody really was, is going to go check out, but I, I would recommend it. I think, it's, I think it works. I really do. You know what doesn't work, Wade? Free held. What doesn't work? Free held. Oh, yeah. What does it say about, about a lesbian drama? That it, what does it say about diversity in Hollywood? That a lesbian drama featuring Julianne Moore and Ellen Page can be just as bad as any other movie that comes out. I feel that's equality. It really is. It's it's unfortunate. It is unfortunate. You yeah. know what? I just think that the, the, there's cardboard characters and cliched characters, and everybody's like, everybody has their little place in the script. You know, the crusader and the angry guy and the sympathetic guy and the beautiful lovers. They, and you you see what Carol does right. Yeah. You know, the way Carol approaches it versus the way Freehold approaches oh, Carol, it. Oh, Carol is magnificent. Yes. So, uh, look, everybody loves... I love Julianne Moore. Ellen Page is fine. It's, um, you know, it's it feels a little uh, self-satisfied, a little proud of itself, but it's, it's getting the story out there. I don't necessarily buy Steve Carell as a dramatic actor. I'm sorry. However, I love Michael Shannon, and he's in this too. So, um, yeah, I would definitely pass on this. I would definitely see Carol over this. Carol is so good. All right, that's it. So uh, we will be back next week, and uh, send us all your goodies to godsdigigods.com. We'll see you soon.